In order to save mutant kind from its ultimate destruction, Charles Xavier has once again betrayed all of them. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Rise of the Powers of X, issue number four, and find out together, shall we? Alrighty then, so picking up directly from where the last issue had left off, Xavier, after coming to the horrifying realization that he was unable to murder Moira as a child, he has now opted to turn on his team, shooting poor Rachel Summers in the back. This obviously pisses off Rasputin 4, who jumps into action to try and take Professor X down. Though Chuck is a slippery one, don't you know, and he already crossed one major line today, so why not keep going? He decides to let Mother Righteous out of her cage in exchange for freezing Rasputin in place. He then has her powers dampened so that he can end up killing her too. Xavier doesn't fear reprisal from Mother Righteous, though, because he knows damn well trying to become a Dominion basically robbed her of any real power. However, Mother Righteous still has plenty of uses for Xavier. Xavier, who crashes this no-place facility back onto what's left of Krakoa with plans to use Mother Righteous as a bargaining chip to earn himself a sit-down meeting with the heads of Orchis. After all, you'll recall that Mother Righteous was actually Stasis's wife, a plot thread that still kind of ends up going unresolved because if you'll remember, Stasis is already dead, meaning Xavier has to have a meeting with Omega Sentinel instead. And if you read Fall of the House of X, then you probably are already know how this meeting goes. Xavier, with his back against the wall and no hope left, decides to try and cut a deal with the AI leaders of Orchis. Let mutant kind live, give them their own small piece of land, and in exchange, Xavier will use his amazing psychic abilities to help the machines win their battle and end up achieving dominionhood. It's a hell of a gamble, one that ends up spitting in a lot of different faces. Rachel actually ends up reforming back in the White Hot Room with the other mutants who were stuck there. Again, and you have to wonder, did Xavier know this was a possibility? Rachel is pissed that that big bald bastard could pull a fast one on her, and with time quickly running out, it looks like the mutants only have one option left. Resurrect the Phoenix so that they can forge the Phoenix Blade and kill a Dominion. Of course, to do all that, though, they're still going to have to actually find a way to escape the White Hot Room. Now, back with Xavier, Omega Sentinel wastes absolutely no time putting his big brain to work, using his psychic powers to weed out the last bit of human resistance inside Orchis, figuring that they won't be able to achieve godhood if they have any weak links in the chain. Xavier then uses his powers to greatly fog the minds of all political leaders around the world, so they can't move to nuke Orchis like they had planned to do over in the pages of Fall of the House of X, and just for good measure, Orchis is also sure to use Xavier to steal all the nuclear codes. So in case the whole Sentinel City plan doesn't work, they still have some absolute weapons of annihilation at their fingertips. Now, while what Xavier did is absolutely unacceptable, it is making waves. Enigma actually is beginning to worry, even though he has seen a future wherein he is victorious. He's never actually seen a scenario wherein history ended up going this direction, and he's starting to actually get a little afraid. So much to the point that by the end of this, he too will actually end up trying to broker a deal with Mother Righteous himself. Jesus, deals within deals, I tell ya. Now, remember how I said the mutants still needed to find a way to escape the White Hot Room, well, in their desperation, they decide the only way they are going to plant brand new flower gates is by resurrecting Mr. Sinister for, like, the third or fourth time, depending. Also, this version of Sinister looks different, because apparently some of Doug's cipher DNA actually managed to get in there in the mix, meaning that he might actually be the only one left who can talk to Krakoa. Rasputin 4 is obviously pissed off to no end that the X-Men could ever do something like this, but Sinister says, hey, let's live to see tomorrow. Then he can feel free to hunt me for sport. Hell, I might even redeem myself by then, though not likely. This crazy flower plan actually ends up working as Rachel, Hope, and the others find their way back to Earth. And honestly, this is kind of a nice callback to the very first issue. In the Krakoan era, when we saw all the different mutants planting flowers, and this is kind of like a literal mutant spring here, a moment of rebirth, etc., etc. And with major heavy hitters like Exodus return to the actual fighting, the mutants are once again again, able to turn the tide of battle against Orchis and their giant murder machines. But will this new infusion of muscle be enough to allow the mutants' time to properly resurrect the Phoenix? We see that the ritual actually involves immolating the body of Jean Grey. But that's not the real shocker. As the comic comes to a close, we actually see some correspondence that the Enigma Dominion is having with other Dominions throughout the multiverse. Apparently, the rebirth of the Phoenix and the creation of the Phoenix Blade is enough to scare 
all of these different god-level beings. After all, the Phoenix Blade is the only thing that could kill them, and if you can kill one, what's stopping you from killing more? And so that was Rise of the Powers of X issue number four, everybody, and once again, this is an X-Men book that left me feeling a little conflicted. On one hand, I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. Lots of cool, big, important stuff is happening, but it's all just happening so close together, it feels like a lot of it is starting to lose its impact. Furthermore, the longer Rise of and House of go on, the more I really start to think to myself, this should have just been one story, maybe even like a weekly series. It just feels so weird to see the same big events, but from different angles and to keep having the perspective change around, but like not actually reveal all that much new information. I'm also really starting to miss the quiet, more character-based moments that the Krakoan era was so known for. There was a moment here in this book where Omega Sentinel opens up to Xavier and says, yeah, you know what, I'm actually from a world where the mutants did commit genocide and did kill all the AI beings. How does that make you feel? And I would really have liked it if this series had more time to really, you know, dig into that conversation and really let us see more of it, but it's just kind of a bump in the road here. Overall, I would give this one a 7 out of 10. Again, it's not bad. In in fact, it's quite enjoyable at times. It just feels like we're running into diminishing returns as we rush to the end of the X-Men. It's Krakoan era, yet also keep adding more and more stuff on top of it. Hey there, everyone. It's your pal, Cape Jewel again. And if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video. And I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers. A lot of cool stuff offering up their exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind-the-scenes concept art for Capes and Quest. That's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and, you know, help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw. So I want to thank you all and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.